Jaime Avalos was driving in the mountains 30 miles southwest of Mono Lake when he saw something shocking. When I had come down this hill, I had seen this creature cross the road. I really wasn't sure what it was. The first thing that came to my mind was, you know, what the heck is a guy in a gorilla suit doing up at this elevation? I started pulling up forward again. And then it came back. As the sun shined onto it, I could see the changes of the muscles moving underneath of the fur. Avalos estimated the creature to be at least seven feet tall. I knew it could be next to my vehicle within a minute. It would have ripped my locked door from my truck, extracted me from my vehicle, and there wouldn't have been a damn thing I could have done about it. Avalos was so shaken by the encounter that he has searched for the creature ever since. Well, I've been finding multiple tracks for a couple of years now, and they all seem to be from the same group, whether it's on the eastern side of the Sierras or whether it's on the western side of the Sierras, and I've been tracking them for over 400 miles. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Susie from Southern California. You are listening to my favorite show, Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with uh, Jaime Avalos. And if you go to sierrasasquatch.com, uh, you can check out his work, read about him, and, and look at some of his evidence. He also puts it up on YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, type in Sierra Sasquatch and uh, subscribe. Check out some of the videos he puts up. And, and I like how he breaks it down as far as the evidence he's collected and kind of his different thoughts on this subject. And I just really like the way he does it. I know that he is currently a nurse and he was actually a former Marine. I guess you're never really a former Marine. Once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine, but he's a veteran. And a lot of his background comes into play with what he does and why he does it. Um, so I'm excited to have him on. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Jaime to the show. Jaime, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, as I was just saying there in the intro, your experience was one of the very first ones I really sat down and watched, and it was on Monster Quest. Um, if you would, tell us a little bit about your background, 
because I think it's kind of important with what you do and why you do it. And then if you would, could you take us back to 2006, uh, tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Jaime Avalos. I am a registered nurse first assistant. I travel in medicine as a registered nurse and a first assistant is somebody, somebody that assists the surgeon in surgery and uh, closes and cuts and coagulates and does everything else. They kind of basically do their side, do my side. When we close a wound, he starts from one side or she, he or she starts from one side and I start from the other side. So, um, so I do, I've, I've been working in the operating room for about 30 years now. I've done a lot of orthopedics. Uh, I've done a lot of different things. Uh, one of my uh, fortes is trauma and also, also vascular work. And um, I was in a um, hospital on a travel assignment up in the uh, Eastern Sierras. And I was just up looking around and just looking for something to do in my 4 by 4 uh, it was on the weekend and I was driving up and uh, I happened upon a uh, jogger on a dirt road and I was asking them where some places I could go in my vehicle. And they told me, well, you can go up this dirt road and way back there, there's this really cool lake and great area to look. And I tried to get up there the first time I got stuck in snow. And so it, it just became so deep in snow because it was still earlier in the year. And that was probably more maybe April, I think, something like that. And um, I, I tried a few times, and eventually I got back up in there. And just a beautiful area where you come up into an area and you're up like maybe nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet, and then you come down into a lake area. And the water is super cold in there. I tried to – I actually tried to fly fish in there, and, you know, just going in the water with my shorts and – you're it's so cold that being in there just for a few minutes the, it goes from numb to actually feel like my legs are in a fire and it's burning because you know things are shutting down on your legs and so it's but it's super clean water so anyways uh, on one of those such occasions i was coming back down that's when I, I could see in the distance where i was at I could see a meadow below me, which had uh, aspens, a little bit of aspens in that area. And I could see another 4x4 four four coming up towards me way in the distance. And as I was coming down, all of a sudden I saw something cross the road. And it, when it crossed the road, it crossed like um, the best way I can describe it. And I've always described it as the uh, show tunes exit, exit stage left. The arms are stiff, and the and the hand or the legs are just moving quickly, but there's no bending of the knee. It was just like a stiff leg, stiff arm, just kind of head, body forward, just kind of coming across really fast. I thought it was really weird. You know, then I'm just that's when I was kind of thinking like, what's a guy doing up here in a gorilla costume? And it just none of it seemed to come together and. Um, so I stopped and I have my camcorder next to me because I always do a lot of filming. And I waited a little bit thinking maybe I might be seeing something else. And, you know, after maybe about a minute, nothing. So I just started to come down again. And then it came back. This time when it came back, it walked like, uh, like you might walk away from a growling dog kind of leaning back with their your feet moving you know in front of you and and it was at that point that i realized that not only was it all black and extremely black but even even the bottom of its feet were black it had uh, it was so black it looked very young so when you look at a puppy or whatever they got that such a dark black on them that they have like a blue hue and it was that blue hue is that reflection where I was seeing the muscle movement. So that's when I instantly realized this is not a person in a costume at all. This is whatever this is, it's real. And, and then I'm thinking to myself, you know, this thing's pretty freaking big, you know, and it, you know, if, if it feels like it wants to come at me, there's it's not anything I'm going to do, be able to do about it. 
but it's never it, it never did anything aggressive towards me. I actually I don't even think it knew I was there. The color of my vehicle was the color of the terrain itself, kind of a brownish. So I don't even think it knew it was I was there. I, it, it seemed to me me like it was a juvenile, was very young because of the coloration and because of the behavior. It was uh, it seemed like when it crossed over, it probably saw the four by four four coming towards me and try to scurry across really quick. And uh, when I got to the meadow, I realized there were some people over there playing frisbee in the meadow, but I couldn't see them through the aspen. So, um, and they're playing frisbee, and they obviously were totally clueless of what was going on. So I didn't even be, bother talking with them because they obviously didn't see it. Because if you saw something that large, they would be freaking out. At that point, I surmised that whatever it was had scurried across because of the 4 by 4 driver, bumped into those people, but they didn't see him, and then came back across trying to do it without eliciting like how we would, not eliciting a chase response from a dog that's growling at you. And I started piecing that together once I got to the bottom. Then that the 4 by 4 couple came by me, it was a, a, a guy and a girl, and uh, they just kind of waved at me, and I waved at them. So it was obvious to me also that they didn't see me. And I noticed in that little meadow there where I saw them cross and where he crossed back that um, the ground, the rock there was tiered. You didn't see tracks, but you could see something heavy had powered itself up that mountain. And... I didn't see anything at the time. I mean, when it happened, but, um, yeah, it was quite interesting. It was at that point where I didn't know what to think because I was just, I, I, you know, I remember as a child hearing about the, uh, the Patterson footage and stuff like that. And I thought it was kind of cool. I didn't think much more about it. You know, here it is decades later, I have something like this and I'm not going up into these mountains thinking about this. I mean, I've been going into the mountains in the Sierra Nevada since the early 80s when uh, I went there for mountain warfare school in the Marine Corps. So that was back, you know, doing um, the survival training, the winter training and stuff like that. It's just a beautiful, beautiful area. Yeah, it does look like a beautiful area. And even your encounter, when I very first started my podcast, I remember cutting a clip from that and putting it in the intro. I've always wanted to ask you, how far away from you was this creature when you saw it? And you know, and this is what I mean when you're talking about size. Because of size, that's how your brain measures distance, right? So... um I first thought, I thought it was like maybe, maybe two, 200 yards, maybe. And then I'm thinking maybe 300 yards when I started thinking about, because when I thought 200, I'm thinking it's really big. And then I started thinking more and I'm thinking maybe, maybe 300 yards, maybe. So maybe somewhere in there. And um, I've gone back to that area and it, it has to be somewhere in between those two marks because I stopped to where I kind of remember where I was at and I looked down, but things changed in the meadow. So, um, but I was definitely close enough that I could see because the sun was starting to go down. It was, it was on an angle now. And that's when I was catching the reflection of the, the hues, the colors on it. And that's, um, so I was definitely close and I was definitely close enough to, to pick up some of the uh, details like the black feet, I mean, I didn't actually see the sole was black, but I could tell from the distance when it lifted its foot up, it wasn't white underneath of it. It was all it was all black. So either, either that or its entire foot had fur on the bottom too, which is probably not so. So, but the, its face was black also because I don't remember seeing anything. And that's the thing is that um, I've seen them also with a, a red reddish color. Yeah, and I, I really want to get into some of these other encounters that you've had. Uh, before we do that, I want to ask you, you know, I think anytime someone has an encounter, myself included, we try to put things in a box. We try to go, well, that's a gorilla. Okay, that's a guy in a gorilla suit. 
because it's so hard to go, okay, that's something I've never seen before that, you know, I'm not sure what that is. You know, it's almost like your brain resets when you're when you're looking at one of these things. Um, I, I'm curious, how did this change your life? You know, after having this encounter and not really giving Sasquatch another thought, now you're seeing it. How did it affect you afterwards? Well, when I saw it, um, the first thing that comes to mind is, hell, I'm not going out there alone anymore. And I've been, I mean, I've been going out alone in the wilderness since I was six or seven years old, you know, when I was in Ohio. And uh, there were some interesting things that had happened in Ohio that I didn't put back, put together until all of this happened, which was, that was, that was quite strange. That's a whole new story in itself. Um, But um, yeah, the first time I went up, I was nervous. I was really nervous, but that's not going to stop me. I like what I like being in the wilderness. And so I either stay home and, and curl up and, you know, hide from it or I face my fear and not let it control my life. So, and I think it was, um, it was first fear. Then it was fascination because then I started realizing, um, you start thinking about what was that? And if that was, cause it definitely, you know, I can see when people talk about it being a, an apish man or a mannish ape. It's like a, somewhere in between the two of them. And so that kind of brought some fascination to it. And I started getting out there and, and then having some uh, encounters. And, and, and none of my counter- encounters have been aggressive. None of them. I mean, I've, I've had one time where um, I was in an area, found some tracks. It was about this time of year, it was really cold out. Nobody, so nobody's out there. All the hikers and campers, they're gone. It was raining, actually. I saw the tracks. I started coming down. And then uh, I stopped for a minute to like adjust my gear. And just like little tiny rocks were flying by me. And it was kind of weird because, you know, that was like the only time that's ever happened. But this was a new area, too. And then I went a little bit farther and then I started, you know, in my mind, I'm always uh, trying to apply a scientific process. And I'm thinking, well, if that was just a coincidence, if I stop again, it won't happen. You know, and so I stopped again and a couple little rocks fly by me. I mean, I can, they must have been like pebbles or whatever. So, So whatever it was, was pretty close. So I thought, well, whatever it is, is probably doesn't want me to around. So I just kept going. I didn't feel like I was being stalked or anything like that, but that's like the only time that's ever happened. I've been in areas where I've seen other people have rocks thrown at them. I mean like big rocks. That was an area where uh, I was just sitting along an old, uh, a waterway and this guy comes in with this huge, this really loud motorboat. And it was like a racer or something. And he must've came all the way up in there just cruising around. I'm just sitting up there and uh, he comes up and it's really loud in this area because it's like a canyon. All of a sudden I start walking away out of the corner of my eye. On the other side, um, this rock comes out of nowhere and it's probably the size of like, I don't know, between a soccer and a basketball, but it's traveled probably a good 100 200 yards and it flew and it just made this huge splash and i thought what the heck is going on and the guy's kind of looking around he's by himself so i started walking away and i could hear more splashing and i could hear the guy cursing he's yelling at something so i figured something happened there but i figured that whatever it was i mean i can't imagine something you know like a person throwing a rock not that size not that distance. Yeah, it's amazing seeing that bit, something that big being thrown from that distance. Um, and you know, it's not a not a man doing that. Uh, I'm definitely with you on that. I would love to kind of get pick your brain a little bit about this subject before we get into that. Um, I know there was two encounters you wanted to talk about, and I'll kind of leave it to you, uh, Jaime. Whichever one you want to start with. 
Uh, if you would, would you start from the beginning, kind of tell us what you were doing and, and what, what did you end up seeing or experiencing and when did this happen? Okay, we'll start with the one that uh, it happened about 2011. Again, I'm, I'm in a new area of traveling and I'm exploring these areas. I'm coming up to an area and I'm frequenting it for a little while, looking around. It's kind of fitting the parameters of what I'm looking for. So I started exploring it and started learning more about it. And I, I just loved doing that to begin with. I was going up there and I normally don't eat McDonald's or Burger King or anything like that. I, I was just really starving and uh, was getting up there. And I stopped at like a McDonald's on the way. I think it was a McDonald's. And I just got a burger and I, you know, throw the bun and I eat the burger itself. And it came with fries. So I had a couple of those. But I set, I, I remember setting it down outside of the car and just to kind of see what's going on around there. And um, I thought maybe a bear may grab it or whatever. I was kind of looking at the wildlife immediately around the area. So um, I sat it there. Went and did my hike. I came back and it was gone. So I came back there, I don't know, a week or so later, went up there, parked where I'd normally parked, hiked over to the trailhead, and then started heading down because then um, where the trailhead is, you can normally drive down, but during the colder times, they shut it, they uh, close it off. So that's an additional two mile hike just to get to, to the area. So, and then that's when you actually start your hike. So uh, I'm there and I'm going along the waterway there, the river or whatever. And I can see imprints in like a, uh, a, a gravelly type of um, bar, like a sandbar. It was enough to create a good print, but not enough to get details from it. So I, I cast some of those prints and, um, and then when I was leaving, I was going to another area just looking around, and I see this, um, uh, uh, what, do you, what do they call it, a glyph. And this glyph was a mixture of, like, somebody took their finger, or a very large finger, or maybe their thumb, and kind of drew this, this image. And then on top of it, it had a stick that was bent, and like a half circle. And it went across this way. And I took some pictures of it, and I thought it was really weird. And so I started thinking, maybe this is, you know, and it looked really fresh. And so I started interpreting the images as something, as, as landmarks, and that maybe something was trying to lead me somewhere with, with that stick showing, you know, from one, from one landmark to the other, that it was telling me to pass through these things and then stop here. So anyways, what I did is I orientated the image with a compass and I shot an azimuth and I looked on a map and I looked for those landmarks and in, in how they were to come together. And I found an area like 42, 45 miles away as a crow flies. And I eventually was able to get up into that area. I don't know, maybe a few days later. And that's where you see the video of the prints in the mud that you see there. Big, long trail of, of tracks. There's some interesting things there where I'm gathering the tracks, casting a bunch. And when I was putting them in my backpack, um, I normally number them. So then I know how they were. It kind of gives me more information on the terrain and how it was how the feet were moving in that terrain, as in the how it changes in its uh, uh, positions, you know, toe toe relationship, things of that nature. So um, I got back to my house and um, I was going through the stuff. I was going to go clean them up. That's when I re realized one of the tracks was missing. So I went back up there with some. Uh, oh well, before I left, I left some treats there. I came back, the treats are gone at this stump where I stopped and took them all out to rearrange them the first go around. Cause I thought maybe I left one there by accident. Maybe it was like, you know, a dirty side up. So I didn't, I didn't see it. That's what I was first thinking, but I left some treats there at that stump, came back a few days later, didn't see the, uh, uh, the calf that I thought the treats were gone, no tracks anywhere. But there was a feather 
like right there in the stump. It kind of looks, it might be a goose feather. It might be, it might be, uh, I'm not really sure what kind of feather it was, but it's in one of the videos, I think, um, called looking back from my YouTube, you see it. I I left it there because I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's like a type of eagle feather. And if it's an eagle feather and if I have it in my possession, I'm in big trouble. So I just took pictures of it and left, left it where it was, where it was. I started bringing back that information and uh, I started put piecing things together. Oh, one thing I did forget to mention when I did do that uh, uh, projection, when I was coming back up after that from the first site, sorry, I'm kind of getting fragmented here. I'm digressing a lot. Uh, is when I had a really good daylight sighting and it was coming from the direction of my truck. So it made me kind of think about, well, maybe whatever that was took that bag of food because that bag of food, if it was a bear, it would have been torn up and just ripped up and eaten. It was just gone. There was no trace of it. I gotcha. And I know we're going back, you know, over 10 years ago, but so you, you found this area, you found the tracks, you cast the tracks. And as you were heading back to the truck, is that when you had the sighting? Right. So I, um, I found the tracks, cast them, got up, saw the glyph, and then shot the asthma. So that's when I digressed to the other spot. That's when I went up and um, I, I had the sighting. It was red in color. You'll, you have a picture of it. It's red in color. It was like that orangutan orange. It was probably maybe 100 yards away, maybe. And it was, I was coming up the trail, and it was crossing over the, the roadway I was telling you about that's closed off. And it was moving. It, was, it wasn't big at all. I mean, it was tall, but it was thin. And, but it was really a bright, bright orange, like a orangutan orange. And when I saw it, you know, it had turned its face towards me. So I got a good shot of his face. And the eyes were, like, really big. I, I think I might have startled it like, I, like it wasn't expecting me to come up because it just ran. But when the thing is, is when it ran – Its head didn't bob. And when humans run, their heads bob because their knees lock. Whatever this does and however its gait is, it doesn't have a a locking knee kind of gait. And so it was like a smooth run where the head didn't bob bob at all. But it was was all, you know, bright orange. And I probably saw it maybe from the chest up. Yeah, so and then it went behind a bush and then I didn't see it anymore. Yeah, and Jaime, I know that you sent me a lot of information, and I'll try and post it all underneath uh, this episode if people want to go and take a look at what we're talking about. Um, did you ever find the track that you made that you left behind? No. No, no, I haven't. No, it was kind of weird. Never found it. So, yeah, the other places where I went. So then I thought, well, in my mind I'm thinking, well, if this truly is what I think is happening – And it's just not something I'm thinking up. I got two pieces of evidence to tie them together. Well, actually three with the glyph. So I took the casting from the first site, which is the picture that you have where they're the darker images. And then I have the brighter ones that are the wider ones that were in the mud that came up cleaner uh, from the other side. And you can put them together and you can see if you look at the big toes you can see um, when well, you don't see a whole lot of image or uh, details on the first one, but on the second one, you do see the um, um, all the details of it. But what you can do, I could literally just put them, I could stack them like Lego blocks and they just fit right together. So same size and they're fitting right on top of each other. So, I mean, that's not, I mean, I can't say 100%, but I I'm pretty confident to say that, that, that it was the same individual. Now, trying to figure out if that glyph tied into that is something else. But I think that's very supportive of that because I would have not have gone to that area had it not been that glyph. Yeah, help me understand that portion of the encounter. Uh, you know, when I think of a glyph, I think of uh, like the Aztecs, you know, they're painting on the side of rocks or a lot of the Native Americans, there's beautiful glyphs you can go look at. 
Um, is that what you mean, or was it like rock, rock, stick, uh, and, or was there something drawn there? It was a mixture of the two. It was like somebody took their finger and drew the landmarks, and then they, uh, um, and then that stick that went across was kind of part of it. Like it was, it was telling me to go from this landmark to this landmark in order to get to this, you know, the, the two, I had to follow these. So it was kind of like, follow this. I uh, orientated it to how it was sitting and how it was directing me and then took my compass and shot an azimuth. And then I used that degree of, uh, of, of which way it was pointing. And then I went to a map and then orientated on a map and started looking at it. And that's when I started looking at those landmarks. Yeah, that's strange, man. I don't know that I would have been that observant to notice it and then to go in that general direction. I've never experienced anything like that. So it's hard for me to really comment on it. But it is fascinating. Uh, you know, the whole topic of Sasquatch is weird. If you would, tell us about the second encounter that you wanted to discuss. Yeah, sure. This one is... uh. This one is really amazing. This is so I'm in a new area traveling, you know, as a nurse, going out exploring when I have time off. I'm going to this area again. I'm projecting some areas of opportunity using this um, kind of formula that I had created that needs it needs to meet some specific criteria in order for me to look at it. And then from there on the map itself. And then from there, I go there, and when I get there, I start looking at the train itself, and then I start cherry-picking some areas to go to and stuff. And that's how I get to where I get. And so um, I'm going up there on my first reconnaissance and driving up, and um, it's winter time, like February. And um, I know I'm going to a little valley, but to get to the valley, I have to get through some peaks, and one of the peaks is around 8,000 feet. And there's snow there. And when I first crossed over early, early in the morning, the, uh, the roadway was more icy. And so it's the snow melt and refreezing. And so it was early in the morning. So my vehicle was able to cross over and I didn't even think about it. And I get to this area, don't really find any tracks or anything, but it was really interesting. And I wanted to get back there and it was a really good it met a lot of my criteria in order to find, you know, things. One of the big things is, you know, since I do a lot of uh, uh, casting and stuff, is one of the criteria is I need to be in an area where I can get some evidence. You know, I can say this, do that, whatever, and, you know, it may look like a good place. But if you don't have any physical evidence of something happening there, it's just basically hearsay. So, um, so anyways, and it also adds a collection so then I can bring them together and match them. So anyways, um, I get there and then I start coming back and now it's warmer out. And so my vehicle is starting to sink into, through that ice. And so now I'm really having struggling getting through the area where I have to cross over the peak. Eventually I get stuck. Um, I have snow all the way up to the frame of my vehicle. So I can't go anywhere. This is around three or four o'clock. And so I'm just thinking, well, you know, this is it. I'm going to have to, uh, you know, I started looking at choices and I thought I'm just going to have to go either 35 miles where I was headed, which is like the closest town, which really isn't a town or eight miles back into where I just came from and um, where I knew I had cell phone reception and hopefully I'll have it then. And, um, so I chose the eight miles packed up. I have a, a survival bag that I carry with me. So it carries a lot of different things in there. I take that with me uh, along with another pair of boots and, and socks and stuff like that. And I start hiking there. Finally get to the area where I need to be and finally get cell phone reception. I call the sheriff, started talking to them from there and tell them what was going on. And um, he seemed a little concerned, far more concerned than I was. But then again, I didn't realize what was going on beyond what was happening with me in, in my area. He was telling me there was a snow storm coming through, you know, 
pretty soon. And then we started talking about stuff. And that's when he told me, well, you know, his main concern is uh, a few years prior to me, some a couple had gotten stuck up there and they couldn't retrieve them until the spring. And when I heard when I heard the word retrieve, I thought that doesn't sound good. Rescue sounds better than retrieve. I thought to myself, well, I need to get back. So I couldn't get anybody to come get my vehicle. I called some people and I told one guy, you know, where I was at, he's going to bring a big truck. He seemed pretty confident until I told him where I was at. Then he's like, there's no way I can make it. And so um, it got to the point where it was no longer retrieving my, taking me with my vehicle. It was just taking me, you know, so I can get, so I can be out of that storm. So I start, I finally talk to the sheriff. We make a, uh, an arrangement where I start heading back and some people are going to come volunteers that have all these heavy duty Jeeps with these big wheels and high, high clearance. And a group of three of them came up, but to come and get me. And so they just got me and then I went back down and then we figured out how to get my vehicle. So I'm, I'm heading back up. I'm heading back and it's getting dark. I have a flashlight with me, but I was more concerned that if I use my flashlight all the time, if it goes out and then if something happens and if I need it, I'm not going to have it. So I'm just going to conserve it. And I also have my um, little GPS, which is those ones that you plug into your little uh, cigarette lighter or whatever. I kept that with me to kind of help me figure out where I'm at on the, on the road. And um, so I turned it on and off. I, you know, hike for a while and then turn it on to see where I'm at and see how much farther I have to go. I'm starting to head back. And it was like, I don't know, around midnight, one o'clock. On the same road that I just came through is this coyote skull. And it's partially eaten. It's ripped. And I can tell that the tissue on it was uh, it's probably an hour, maybe two. I mean... I worked in the operating room enough that I know what open tissue looks like if it's been open for a while. So um, it was really bizarre. And the, the most bizarre part was there wasn't any tracks of anything, nothing that was there. So, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking, well, maybe bird dropped it. The thing with the bird dropping it, it, it wouldn't bounced. It was, it wasn't sunken into the snow. It was just like set there. And then one of the eyes, and I showed you the pictures, one of the eyes is still there. and um, The birds normally, that's one of the first things they go for is the eyes because it's soft tissue. But one is still there. One is missing, one is still there. So, and the rest of it is ripped. And you can see what it, when I, you know, first saw it, you know, I thought because of the color, I thought it was a raccoon. But then the more I looked at it, I'm like, no, that's, that's a coyote. So, and it was, a, it was like a baby coyote. It wasn't a big one. I kept going after a while, you know, and I'm hiking at night. I'm trying to keep my night vision. I can see better that way, actually. And I, I, I mean, I've trained that way for decades. You know, even, you know, it was something I learned in the Marine Corps a long time ago. After a while, I bump into an area and there's a strong, strong smell of a skunk. You know, here it's middle of February. I'm about 8,000 feet. I don't think there's a skunk out here. And it was really weird because as I'm filming, I'm like, I can smell it. I can smell it. I can't smell it anymore. It was gone. So that was really strange. I kind of felt in a way like maybe I was being followed, but I wasn't sure. I didn't hear anything, but um, I, I got that sense. And I, I, I kept hiking. I got to an area where my boots got so wet from my first pair of boots uh, they were supposed to be waterproof that they were soaked so I you know took them off and no wait I had already taken them off and I put them in my backpack that's right because they were they were really heavy I took them off when I talked with the sheriff I changed out then and I came back up but anyways I was sitting there I stopped because of the pack was so heavy from those boots that um, I took my pack off, relaxed, and I normally carry this, uh, it's a, a spot GPS locator. It's one of the old ones, so it's really big. 
And I normally carry it on the inside of my pocket with a clip holding on the outside. And I sat there. I put the boots. I was looking for a place to put them. And there was like a big rock on the other side of the road. And I put them on top because I thought, well, I'll just come back in the spring and get them later. I'm sitting there going through some of my stuff, trying to get a little something to eat, you know, get, getting that pack off my back, getting the boots out. Then I start um, start hiking in, and I keep going, and I, I'm going it for a while more. Then all of a sudden, I start hearing truck noises, like big trucks. And I'm thinking, all right, that these are the folks that are coming to get me. And I'm like, wow, I need to get going faster because uh, I thought I was still a good distance away. Then it occurred to me that um, there's nobody on the road. And there's no other road out there. I mean, there's probably trails, but they're in feet of snow. But And these were big trucks. I could, It sounded like two of them. I couldn't figure out where that sound was coming from. It was, and it, was, it sounded like trucks. So it was kind of weird because I've also heard about people with, uh, um, that hear sounds and, and the weird sounds. I mean, I've, I've had an encounter before where I thought I heard something jump and smashing trees and then landing, come back later and look at the area and nothing is broken. So then that was like, but so anyways, I'm going along. I finally get to the spot. I get into my vehicle. I'm probably there. I don't know, like an hour or so. And then all of a sudden I see flashlights. These guys come and get me and they're having a hard time getting out of there. But even with these big trucks and they're like looking at me, like how they're looking at me, like how in the hell did you get back here? And because they're like sinking really deep, finally get back there by morning. And then we come back up later and we're able to pull my truck out. So don't think any more about it. I don't know, like about a month goes by and I get a call from uh, the sheriff again saying that somebody else had called me. And I guess I forgot that they were on my system. It set out a help beacon from my GPS thing. And this GPS thing, the buttons are really tiny. So you have to push them in and hold them for like three to four seconds to turn it on and then press and hold the other button that you want, like the SOS or whatever, to make it activate. So that takes a good amount and they're, they're really small and I, I have pictures of it. So anyways, um, um, he tells me about it. I'm like, no. And I'm like, Oh my God. So then I started looking into my stuff and I can't find my GPS. So I'm like, but then, well, it's obvious because it's up there somewhere. I see the map I got, and I do have the map. It shows the markings and you can see whatever it is. It shows like six of them. It shows that it's moving around and then, it, and then it crosses the road. And then like, like a bunch of them on one day. And then like maybe two days later, it sends out an SOS signal. For some reason, it doesn't uh, get the GPS coordinates. All the other ones had the GPS coordinates. So either it, it got flipped upside down or some way where it wasn't facing up to the sky. I thought that was really interesting. So I uh, got that, those coordinates and I started heading out there when I first could, which is like maybe a month later, when I could finally get up there and I start looking in those areas. I find the area, I just start doing a big spiral, trying to find this GPS, it's bright orange. I can't find it anywhere. So um, I'm just going along. And then I started noticing, I went to one side where I saw a lot of the mark or the, a lot of the times that it did it, I uh, sent off a, a message. And uh, I find this nest, it looks like a nest where they've broken branches and made this pile, and you can see, you have the video of that, and right behind it is a giant X, like, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 feet away from it. So it's a nest, and then you can see it's like right there, right next to each other. So I set up a trail cam, and I, um, I modify it to kind of help to get more pictures from it because of the distance. And so it would have, whatever it would have to, get really close in order for it to trigger. So I modified it. So it was like more of a, you know what a plot watcher is? Yeah. So it was kind of more of like a plot watcher. So you get more images. 
And then I, I set it up and I set it in the area of kind of like where I was an expectation where I'd find something because this was like an area where I might be able to see something and there was the nest and then there was the cross or the, the X. So this is right in that area. So um, I come back later. I got some images and I thought they were interesting. So um, I downloaded those images to my computer, set the thing back up, put it out again came back like maybe a week later and um, the uh, trail cam was gone. Yeah, that's strange. Did you ever find your uh, GPS unit? No, no, it's gone. I actually had to buy another one. I got it like some guy on uh, on uh, uh, a Craigslist had one near me. Yeah, that's bizarre because you're kind of in an area where there's no one there. I mean, a major storm was coming through and you had to be rescued yourself. And, you know, you were talking about that feeling of someone was following you. And, you know, from being a Marine that you go with your gut, you're probably right. I get it, though. You didn't hear anything. You didn't really see uh, what was following you. But you kind of had that sense of of being followed. I want to ask you about the GPS. Could you tell uh, from the GPS when it was traveling from point A to point B how fast it was traveling? Um. Well, and that's what I was just looking at. What I saw is that it would, I think when it's in the help mode, it sends out a couple of them, a couple messages. I think it, that's what it does. But um, you can see like one, and it gives you the time and the coordinates. And then, and then the second one gives you the time and the coordinates. But when you see it on the map, there, it's really neat because you can see where it's bouncing around. And then the final one is it's across the street. It's all across the road on the last one. And then, well, the last one was the SOS where it didn't pick it up at all. It just picked up that somebody said an SOS. So um, it didn't pick up anything else. Yeah, and then he decided to go back. I can kind of see why you would go back. It's a creepy story about the GPS. It reminds me of uh, the North American Wood Ape Group. Uh, I had uh, Bob Strain on, and they're trying to do something very similar uh, they have these little GPS trackers, and they put them in uh, kind of a substance to where it'll stick to the creature, and they put it in food and that sort of thing. And I remember Bob telling me, you know, it's just bouncing around, going from one location to the next, and it was almost impossible how fast it was actually moving. Um, Bob explains it better than my caveman explanation, but uh, that's kind of what it reminds me of. Do you think you must have just dropped the uh, GPS on your way back then, huh? I think somehow it it got it because I've been carrying that thing since 2007 when I started going out because I always go out by myself. And like I said, it's always on the inside of my pocket and it's clipped. And so I've been carrying it that way for what at that time, four years. So, and it's always been that way and it's never fallen out. And even if it did fall out, it would be in one place and it wouldn't trigger itself. Yeah, it's definitely strange. I'm with you on that. Let me ask you, you'd mentioned you kind of have a list of criteria before you'll even decide to go look in an area. What is that criteria made up of? What's kind of on the list? Well, I look at, you know, in the Marine Corps, when we look at movement, we look at, uh, we used to call it avenues of approach. So depending on what you're looking at, if you're looking at armored vehicles, you're looking at way how armor vehicles could come into your area. So you're looking for areas how they can come in. So you're not going to look for an armored vehicle to come over a cliff. But you are. You would anticipate people that are just coming in in platoons or in squads to repel from there. Right? So you got to fit that parameter. And with these, these guys, it fits the parameters of my interpretation on their abilities. So what they're being able to do. So... And also stealth. If I'm going to be sneaky and if I'm fast and I'm strong, you know, just because uh, I can't do it doesn't mean they can't do it. And I I think that's where a lot of people kind of get lost on that because they think, oh, there's no way that somebody could go through there. And what they're really saying is there's no way that I could go through there. And uh, you're talking about something that is, uh, is built for that terrain. 
you know, unlike us. I mean, a cougar can jump like 15, 20 feet straight up. I can't, I can't jump 15, 20 feet straight up. Uh, just because I can't do it doesn't mean a cougar can't. So, yeah, I'm looking for those areas. And, you know, um, the food is, is not big on my list. And I think that's one thing is that people look at food as, you know, you know food sources and stuff like that. There will be times where they'll be that way. But you're also talking about something that knows how to hide its tracks and knows how to be stealthy. And that's a, a whole new thing about when I talk about trackways and some of the tracks that I have and, and um, how people think, oh, they're human. And I'm like, wait, no, because these tracks, they're doing things that humans can't. And you, you'll see some of those videos there or the videos and, uh, and photos. So they go, they go from a flat foot to one with an arch and humans can't do that. And there, I got plenty of background for that. So those are some of the, uh, those are the criterias. Um, and this is my own opinion. If you're really serious about doing what you want to do and you're really looking at getting that information, you have to submerge yourself into being uh, a resident of the wild, not a visitor. That's why I don't take food with me. That's why I'm, the way I move is different than a human. A lot of people, a lot of people that, uh, a lot of hunters that have had sightings are bow hunters because bow hunters move more stealth than somebody with a rifle. Yeah, I would agree a hundred percent. Yeah. I actually had a guy, uh, I was actually having making, make me a survival bow. He was asking me, you know, finally one day he was asking me, so why do you want to have this? So I'm finally like, I'm backed up into it. I'm like, okay, you know, this is what's going on. I had a sighting, this and that. I thought he was just going to be like, look at me and just like, you know, just here's your bow. Give me the money. Get the hell out of here. And he looked at me and he was quiet for a moment. And he said, I had a sighting too. And uh, that's on my YouTube. Um, his name is Mike Rash. He's a boyer, a boy, uh, bow maker. So you go through his shop and stuff like that and the, the bow that he made. But he, he talks about his experience. And it was really interesting too because – what we see here in the Sierras is, is uh, smaller, and that makes sense because if you look at Bergman's rule, where the larger the mammal, the higher, the more north they are, and it has to do with the ability to retain or or release heat. So if you're if you're a small mammal, and there's always exceptions, if you're still a small mammal, the likelihood of you being far north is not as great as a large animal because the large animal can. It has more surface area, so it can retain heat. But if you're a big animal, you're not going to be so close to the equator because you have a harder time getting rid of that heat. And there's exceptions. You look at the African elephant, you know, and they the African elephant. But there's they have their own their own ways of me or mechanisms of being able to release that heat. Like with an elephant, they have the blood vessels in the ears that they fan it. And that's what cools them off, right? So a bigger animal can be close to the equator. Yeah, I think that's really cool you brought up uh, Bergman's rule. And I know it, it has to do with, like you said, organisms at higher alt altitudes um, should be larger and thicker than those close to the equator. And he's actually right about that. You know, I, even from interviewing eyewitnesses, I can tell you, you know, people use phrases like King Kong or stuff like that, you'll get that in the Pacific Northwest and going up into Canada. And I know down south, they'll talk about them being, you know, six to eight feet tall. Um, not quite the month, still large, don't get me wrong, but not quite the sizes that people describe here in the Pacific Northwest. And I know it's, it's a very general rule. It doesn't always apply. There's always exceptions. After 15 years of looking into this and kind of investigating, I know that you go out there in the middle of nowhere. I've seen, I've watched your videos before in the past, and you're not on trails. You're like Robert Kreider. I mean, you guys go, you guys are crazy. You guys go out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but after 15 years of, of looking into this, I want to ask you, is there anything that surprised you about the creatures, whether it be behavior or appearance? I think one thing that um, I would like to share is I believe that they understand intention. 
an intention it just isn't a, a mental thing that you may throw off but intention also has to deal with your body movement your posturing animals they don't give a damn what you say they don't know they don't know there's an old uh, far side where the guy's like cussing off the dog blah 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 he's like something ginger you need to stay out of where there, ginger you keep out of there, ginger and then it says this is what ginger hears blah 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 ginger blah 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 ginger so, so they don't know they don't understand you know they don't understand communication that's not how they communicate the like most animals they communicate with body posture pheromone pheromones and body uh where you stand you know so if you stand on a high peak you're acting more dominant you know if you posture in a certain way you're showing either aggression or submission so for instance um when people smile you show your teeth animals don't look at that as a uh, as a uh, happy moment or a, a good gesture they look at as you're either fearful or you want to attack because showing teeth is, uh, is, is an aggressive move. Direct eye contact. If you come in contact with a bear in the wild, the last thing you want to do is make eye, eye contact with it, you know, eye to eye. Because what you're showing is uh, you are showing that you want to compete with it. And that's when they attack because that's how they interpret things. So, you know, if you're really out there and you want to really see something, you need to understand nature in itself. You need to understand what the residents of the wild are saying to become accustomed to what's going out. So every time you go out, you should, you know, even though you may not have a sighting or gather anything, you should bring something back with you. Some little tidbit of information that later down the road will help you. So your goal should always be when you go out that you get something from the wilderness. Like I know with some, some animals, they alarm when, uh, when you come by, but they stop alarming when you stop moving. And other animals won't alarm when you walk by, but they do when you stop. So learning those things, you have to be a part of the wilderness and not a visitor. And when you get to that level, then your your chances of having an encounter are far greater. So in, intention is big. Um, I think Jane Goodall, Goodall used to, you know, when she was with gorillas, she'd break branches to simulate feeding. So again, you're you're showing that you're part of part of the wilderness. You're a resident, not a visitor. And so I think that's really important to do if you're going to have a way of uh, trying to communicate you know um, unfortunately we see a lot of people out there that have the uh the lottery mentality where they think if they just get a picture they're set i'm like look patterson has a huge film and it's still being debated yeah it's good advice as far as uh intention goes and even you know even we as humans we do that to other humans you're walking down the street someone's coming your way and you're already sizing them up. You're, you know, you can definitely read a lot by the way someone carries themselves, and even kind of what kind of mood they're in. Yeah, and it's all about awareness, and that's one thing that um, uh, on my dot com site I talk about awareness and the ability to increase your powers of uh, scent, smell, vision, and hearing. And but it, it requires a discipline. You know, it requires a discipline to do it. You're just not going to go out into the wilderness and, and do this. It, you got to really want to do that. And it's taken me a while to kind of figure out, figure it out. And then I go more into deep uh, detail as to how and why that works. You know, so there's a medical aspect to it, you know, also. Yeah, it's good advice. And I think your background helps you a lot, you know, from being a Marine to now being a nurse. And if people want to go check it out, go to sierrasasquatch.com. Uh, check out Jaime on YouTube under Sierra Sasquatch. Subscribe and kind of go through some of his videos. I know you're on Facebook, too. I'll throw all the links in there. I want to ask you, Jaime, I ask everyone and there's no wrong answer. Uh, but if someone were to ask you, what do you think Sasquatch is? What would you say? You know, the only thing I can think of, and 
trust me, I've pondered about this a lot. And then, you know, cause there's, there's things that, um, that just really throw me off, especially the ability to create sounds, you know, to mimic sounds. So, and not just animals, but car noises and a bunch of other things that, you know, crashing a wilderness. I lean into, it's more of an ancient human, an ancient man. I, I think about it and I think about how some of the trackways are and um, they're just really good at what they do. It, and that's might be what it's all about. When people talk about them disappearing, um, you know, tracks, I think a lot of times I think they're jumping because um, I have trackways where this one is walking through mud. They stand together and you can see the mud is just pushed to the sides like it jumped. And then I can't find the tracks anywhere. They just stop. But fortunately, I, if I saw that on regular ground, I would really be wondering what's happening. But since it was in mud, it was showing me that it applied a lot of energy to the ground. So that's telling me that it jumped, especially with its feet are side by side. And I mean, like I said before, you know, Korg, uh, cougar jumps, you know, 20 feet straight up hard telling what these can do. And, and I think we're still understanding it. And, um, you know, the, the, the foot itself and this whole, uh, metatarsal break, I guess, or uh, mid tarsal break is what they call it. I think there's more into that, especially with the fact that I'm um, seeing these trackways that look human ish. I mean, if you look at them and if you don't have a real good background in medicine, especially anatomy, you wouldn't be able to pick out stuff like going from an arched foot to a flat foot. When I saw that, I'm like, that's the human can't do that. I know that there's only two types of flat feet, flexible and, and fixed. Both of them, you're, you're just, you're flat foot. You just can't go back. You know? Um, I mean the flexible you can, but it would take a lot of training and stuff like that to get those muscles to work again. But uh, it would be a gradual thing. But for you to go from instant flat foot to instant arch, no, ain't going to happen. Something is going on there. There's, there's probably um, more attachments, more collateral ligaments that, and tendons that are being able for that to allow that to happen. I think it's the posterior tibial tendon that actually creates that main support structure but and that's what normally gets lax and creates the flat foot, and then that's your when your your foot fly, uh, slides off its base, and that's what creates the flat foot is when it slides uh, when it slides in medially. But yeah, it's really so some something else is going on there, and there was also the, with the flexibility we're talking also um, if you were to take a blood tr uh, a blood test of them a blood sample, I would not be surprised if. Um, they have a, a high progesterone hormone blood level in them because I'm, I'm, some of the flexibility I'm seeing is uh, not what you would, you know, something, it's, it's something is happening where they're extremely flexible in human terms. Somebody to be that flexible would be like a, a female who's pregnant because their ligaments progesterone creates those is a hormone that helps make the ligaments more lax so that she's able to pass the baby through birth. And, and the things that I've seen, there's a picture there where you, that the ridge is just straight up and down, and <laughs> it can't happen. You're going to compromise your capsules. Over every joint, there's a capsule that holds it in place, and it has synovial fluid. like It's like the oil of it. It can only, it can only go so far before it's compromised. It breaks or whatever. But this is not happening, so somehow... It's maybe the attachments differently, or maybe there's just so much of a progesterone level in there that's making it that much more flexible. So it's really, really intriguing to me because I started thinking about this. And, you know, I, I, I have the fortunate opportunity to talk to surgeons all the time. So I'm podiatrists and stuff like that. And I'll ask them questions and they kind of look at me weird because they have no idea what I'm driving at. And that's fine because, you know, if I told them what, was I, what I was doing, they would think like, you know, I don't want to talk to this guy anymore. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I would love for you to come back, uh, Jaime. I would love to pick your brain. Uh, would you come back for a part two? 
That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'm actually looking at doing a uh, a breakdown on on the uh, flexible uh, flexibility because uh, and you have a picture there of uh, there's a guy that has a uh, it shows his foot compared to one of the tracks and when you look at them you look at the, when you break it down and you look at the angles and stuff and you look at the ratios it's if you see the cast by itself it's hard to pick it out but when you compare it to a human foot then it's like it's it's pretty obvious it's way way different and when i look at something i'm that's what i'm seeing in my head i'm comparing it to things that i already know so uh but yeah that'd be awesome to do that yeah yeah, and I'll try and post as much as I can underneath this uh, episode. I recommend, though, that people go to SierraSasquatch.com, go to YouTube and type in Sierra Sasquatch. Definitely subscribe to Jaime, and I'll include links for your Facebook and everything else. Um, but, you know, it, it was an honor for me to chat with you, Jaime. You were one of the very first uh, people I really sat down and watched talk about their encounters on uh, Monster Quest, and I can't wait to do... Uh, a part two with you, but I really appreciate your time and uh, enjoyed chatting with you. Well, I'm uh, I'm I'm very honored uh, to be on, and I'm really flattered that uh, that you've been following me because I, I had no idea, I didn't know. So it's good to know that I got somebody like you there uh, looking at some of my stuff. I think it's great. I appreciate it, and I can't wait for part two. Uh, thanks again, Jaime. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.